this edition of Exposé, Inside the Criminal Justice System. It was almost a taboo type subject because you're, you are talking about killers and vicious killers. It's the ultimate punishment, but is it fair? The first thing he said was, he is on death row unjustly and I feel terrible about it. Funding for Exposé has been provided by I was educated in high school by Jesuits, whose philosophy is all about helping others, not because they're people you like, not because they're people who are like you, but because they're people. Everyone is entitled to a certain amount of dignity and respect. That still guides an awful lot of the decisions I make, and I think that in my career, it's sort of shaped a lot of the choices that I've made. Reporter Stephen Henderson has spent his career writing about the inner city in places like Detroit, Chicago, and Baltimore. He has a passion for trying to bring stories to the front of everybody's consciousness that matter to the country and to democracy, and he's made a habit of doing those. In 2002, Henderson was working in Baltimore when he got a call from Knight Ritter News Service, now McClatchy. The Washington Bureau of McClanch called and said, would you like to cover the Supreme Court? And I've always thought that was a pretty high calling for a reporter. That it's one of the sort of premier beats. I felt like it was a challenge I wanted to take on. When I went to cover the court, I didn't have a lot of legal journalism experience. And so soon after I started covering, I went and bought a couple of leather-bound versions of the Constitution. And I can't tell you how many times you're writing a story or reading something, and it always helps just to go back to the text itself. I carried this around with me every day. The Supreme Court, it's the third branch of government. It's the one that gets the least attention by journalistic organizations. I find that pretty remarkable given the effect that the court has on America and the world. Henderson couldn't have known it, but his work on this new beat would lead him on a quest sparked by a Supreme Court decision, a decision that spared the life of a convicted killer in a capital murder case. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, writing for the majority, said the man's attorneys had failed to thoroughly investigate his past history in violation of the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment has been interpreted by the court not only to guarantee you a warm body in the seat next to you in the chair that says lawyer, but an able body, as somebody who's qualified for what they're doing and is working as hard as they can on your behalf. Henderson learned that the Supreme Court has outlined strict standards for how lawyers should defend criminal cases, particularly the penalty phase of capital cases. The court keeps returning to this topic to say, look, when you're dealing with somebody's life in particular, you have to have a vigilant defense, a vigorous defense. And in death penalty trials, it means arguing strongly about why your client ought not be executed. The court has held that death penalty defense must include evidence about the defendant's life history, including factors such as extremely low IQ or childhood abuse that might lead the jury to impose a lesser sentence than death. Reading an American Civil Liberties Union report in 2003, Henderson found a provocative case in Mississippi was that magic moment where you put two and two together and think, okay, I, I really do have something. There was a passage in this report about an inmate who is one of the most mentally disturbed guys on Mississippi's death row. 
The first of many cases Henderson would report on concerned Ronnie Lee Connor, convicted of cutting the throat of an elderly woman during a robbery. He was sentenced to death, despite a long history of mental illness. It talked about how Ronnie howls all night through the night, keeping everybody else up, and how he goes to the bathroom in his cell constantly. And it mentioned that these were things that weren't dealt with at Ronnie's trial. And I thought, this is something we ought to do, and, and Ronnie is, is where we ought to start. Henderson worked the phone to find out more about Connor's case. The appellate lawyer confirmed that critical details about Connor's mental state had not been introduced at trial. Even Connor's psychiatrists, who were readily available, were not called to testify. Henderson reported his findings to investigative editor Jim Asher. Jim was very excited about the story from the beginning because he just hadn't seen a story about this before. And it was almost a taboo type subject because you're, you are talking about killers and vicious killers. To us, the idea wasn't whether the institutions of government or the society should say people should pay with their lives if they kill other people. For us, the issue was, if you set standards on how people should be killed, are you meeting those standards? The Ronnie Lee Connor case inspired the team to examine a range of cases from various states to see if the problem was widespread. Henderson first chose four states that provide little or no funding for death penalty defense. Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and Virginia. Next, he had to define which cases he would examine. A way to standardize that would be to identify the 20 most recent convictions, say, and death sentences handed down in those states. Uh, and so that's where we started. Eighty death penalty cases. Researching them would be a monumental task. Thousands and thousands of pages of transcripts had to be read and organized. We pretty quickly decided that as the full-time Supreme Court reporter for McClatchy, I, I wasn't going to have time to go siphoning through all of these these uh, these records for what we needed. So we hired a company out of Atlanta that had paralegals, and pretty quickly they said, oh, we have a perfect guy for this, a guy named Jeff Skelton. Henderson worked with Skelton for months on the phone. They met for the first time in person when expose took Henderson back down to Georgia to go over the particulars of his reporting. Henderson hired Skelton to collect information about the penalty phase of the cases. This is the second part of a death penalty case, just after the conviction, when defense attorneys have the opportunity to present evidence that could persuade that same jury not to impose the death sentence. Now that we've found this person guilty, what does our justice system say should happen to this person? Not just based on the case, but very oftentimes based on that individual's background. To try to get a feel for who this person really is, what kind of justice does this person deserve. When we hired Jeff and I said, I'll bet we'll find that on average these lawyers do a pretty decent job, that this is not a routine everyday problem. But it became pretty clear after just a few weeks of his work that that was really not the case. It was a much more everyday failure. The way that these states had decided to handle capital defense work was inadequate. Uh, there was one case that I reported to Steve where the entire sum total of the penalty phase of the trial was the defense attorney stood up and said one sentence and with that your honor the defense rests and i couldn't help but think to myself this man did absolutely nothing skelton found another case in which the lawyer rather than introducing detailed facts about the defendant's very low iq and history of child abuse asked the jury to consider what would jesus do the judge told the jury to disregard the statement the man was sent to death row. In the summer of 2004, during a Supreme Court recess, Henderson hit the road to review death penalty case files himself. His editor gave him some friendly advice. I probably carry a northeastern bias, but I knew that going into some of the rural areas of Mississippi and Alabama might be a challenge for Steve Henderson. He's a black fellow from Detroit. He and I joked about how when he rented a car, it couldn't be read. When he drove, he had to go five miles under the speed limit. 
Was I nervous? Uh, probably the first time I went because I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I do remember that on the drive, I passed a business on the side of, of the road that had a flagpole that had to have been, I don't know, 70, 75 feet tall. And it had the largest Confederate flag I had ever seen in my life just flapping in the breeze. And here I am driving past this on the, on the way to this small town to report about this murder. I, you know, I noticed that. Henderson went to court after court, reading case after case, and reviewing the life stories of the defendants, often victims themselves, of violence, abuse, and tragedy. Finally, it was time to call the defense attorneys who had handled the death penalty cases. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that I had a pretty big knot in my stomach. These are people who are now on death row, at least in some part because their lawyers didn't do what they were supposed to do. And so I was ready for some angry pushback and maybe some shouting. And I could not have been more surprised by what we actually encountered. The very first lawyer I called, a man named G. Terry Jackson, sat very quietly on the phone as I explained to him what I saw in the file. The first thing he said was, I didn't get the money I needed to investigate Warren's case. He is on death row unjustly, and I feel terrible about it. Um, and that sort of played out over and over again in these cases. McClatchy, Steve Henderson. Henderson also called lawyer Tammy Jacobs, a Harvard-educated public defender in Georgia who handled two of the cases he would eventually write about. In each, Jacobs asked the local judge for more funds to order full psychological evaluations and hire local investigators. But the courts didn't give her the money. Despite Jacobs' best efforts, both clients ended up on death row. I don't think there's a lawyer assigned to a death penalty case that it doesn't hit on a very visceral emotional level. I've never met a lawyer that hasn't cared about his or her client that hasn't tried. I don't think death penalty lawyers lack the desire. They just lack the resources and the funds. In two previous death penalty cases, Jacobs had taken on $30,000 in personal debt to better defend her clients to no avail. This is very intensive work. It can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars if you do it the right way. So and the, the, some of these guys are doing it on less than $10,000 total. That really opened another window of the problem was that this wasn't something that people were unaware of or even in denial about. They, they knew that there was a problem and that, they, that these states were not doing their job under the Constitution. After reviewing 80 death penalty cases and talking to dozens of lawyers, Henderson had the facts he needed to begin drafting the story. He had determined that in 73 of the 80 cases, the defense during the penalty phase was not up to Supreme Court standards. Oh, yeah. But he and his editors yeah. decided to go further and also review the appeals process. If the lawyers were not doing their job at trial, why were the appeals courts not reversing more decisions? As Henderson reviewed the appeals of one death penalty defendant, he ran across the dean of the Pepperdine Law School, who is better known for investigating the Monica Lewinsky affair, Kenneth Starr. A supporter of the death penalty, Starr had nonetheless worked on a convicted killer's appeal on a pro bono basis. The Supreme Court has said that death is different. That is, if society is going to seek the ultimate sanction, then society needs to provide additional measures of protection to make sure that there is fairness. If we're going to have the death penalty, we need to make sure that it's fairly administered. Starr's client, Robin Lovett, was a drug addict convicted of the fatal stabbing of a pool hall manager during a robbery. Starr argued on appeal that the original trial attorneys failed to adequately supply the jury with information about Lovett's drug-addicted mother and the stepfather who sexually abused him. Shouldn't that have come before the jury in terms of explaining why Robin Lovett had a serious drug problem? And at least take that into account in determining whether the ultimate sanction of death should be imposed uh, here. Citing Lovett's attorney's performance as well as mishandling of some key evidence, Starr petitioned the governor of Virginia for clemency. When granted, 
It was a major news story. Governor Mark Warner commuted the death sentence for Robin Lovett. It is the first time Governor Warner has ever granted clemency. But upon reviewing dozens of other cases, Stephen Henderson quickly learned that most death penalty appeals don't involve superstar pro bono lawyers, and that almost across the board, the appeals courts were not abiding by Supreme Court standards. You had patent failures in an awful lot of these cases, and almost none of them had been overturned. By 2005, Henderson was ready to begin drafting the second section of his investigation. He had been reporting the story for almost two years, but still hadn't published. And the Supreme Court beat was taking more of his time than ever, with the death of Chief Justice Rehnquist and the retirement of Justice O'Connor. Covering that from beginning to end is an incredible sort of marathon, and you're not doing anything else while that's going on. Meanwhile, his editors were getting antsy. It became a joke in the Bureau about, can't you get this story done, Steve? Jim, what's going on? I took some flack, yeah. Yeah, I think they would say it was good-natured flack, and I think I would say it was often good-natured flack. <laughs> I think any, every editor wants the story yesterday. Uh, it's, that's sort of their nature. Steve may tell you that my repeated questions to him when the story would be ready over a period of three years <laughs> struck him as humorous. It, it may have struck me as a little less humorous. But there were additional reasons Henderson wasn't ready to publish. He learned that one of the states he was focusing on, Georgia, had recently changed its law, creating a new statewide office for funding the defense of death penalty cases. Henderson went to the office in Atlanta to ask director Chris Adams if he could follow a case. He wanted to observe what a death penalty defense that is funded by the state would look like. We have reporters occasionally call, and the first thing you try to assess is, you know, what's this person's angle? Is this somebody that you can work with and that you can trust? And I'm not sure I've ever wanted any media people following around any of my cases. So I've been told no all day by lawyers who, who are just too fearful that having a reporter in the middle of, of their case would really screw it up. And so he introduces me to Boyd Young. He sits down and I give him my spiel about what I'm doing and why I wanted to do it. And he looks across the table, he goes, sure, that sounds like fun. What was different about Young and his colleagues is that they decided a news story might actually help their client avoid death row. Their client was 38-year-old Cynthia Allen. The lawyers would have to defend her guilt or innocence for the murder of four people in Valdosta, Georgia. If she were found guilty, they'd have to defend her life. Henderson headed to Valdosta with the lawyers. They were determined to spend the time, money, and effort necessary to defend Cynthia Allen. This would include learning about any facts in her life history that might convince a jury to spare her if she were convicted. They retraced some of their steps for expose. The stakes were very high for them because Cynthia's life was on the line in this case. The, the state was very serious about the idea that they were going to execute her. The defense team described Allen's crime. While staying at a flop house in Valdosta, she got into a fight. In retaliation, she set a blanket on fire on the porch, but the whole house burned down and four people died. Uh, the first time that Steve came down to Valdosta, the two of us went out and went to the crime scene where the fire had happened and walked around knocking on doors, looking for neighbors. I think Steve got a real taste of how difficult and long of a process it can be. You can spend hours and get 10 minutes worth of information. To defend Cynthia Allen with the thoroughness demanded by law, Georgia Capitol defenders followed American Bar Association guidelines, standards the U.S. Supreme Court has deemed appropriate. That meant two full-time attorneys, a fact investigator, and a mitigation specialist. And they'd need to pay for trips, including room and board, to three different states. Ideally, you want to talk to every person uh, that has ever talked to or been impacted by the client and what they can share to shed some light on the client's humanity so that we can bring that out to a jury and say, look, this is a real person. They did a bad thing, but they're not beyond redemption. You don't have to kill them. From Valdosta, the group took off on a long road trip to find her family. 
in the storm-battered city of new orleans after katrina, her whole family was displaced and it was very difficult to track them down and to and to find them. she has seven children and they don't have permanent addresses. so we had a general area um called the fisher housing projects where we knew they they had been and probably had returned to. it was very quiet very deserted and there was a ah tension in the air. narrator one guy was actually back from houston um post katrina and we started asking them if they knew cynthia allen or knew her family. while at the fisher projects trying to find more clues henderson and the lawyers witnessed a fight between several residents. Cynthia Allen's lawyers are so focused and so determined to represent her the way that she should that it didn't seem to face them that this is dangerous. You could get caught up in what's going on here. For days, Henderson watched the lawyers on a frustrating search, asking for school records that had been destroyed, knocking on doors where the people had moved. Finally, the lawyers got a break in the case. They found two of Cynthia Allen's children but how to get them to talk freely about their mother. Okay, is this Wagner? I think it is. Make a right. right. They decided that, that one way to get Cynthia's children to open up with them would be to drive them from New Orleans to Valdosta. These kids had not seen their mother since she left New Orleans to go to Valdosta some two years before this. So the original plan was that we'd all be in one car together. But just as the lawyers in Henderson were leaving, they hit another hurdle. Unfortunately, the judge in the case, uh, before we took the trip, decided that he wanted to issue a gag order in the case and tell all the parties not to talk to anybody in the press. And so we tried to observe that by separating the, the, the parties on the trip. So the lawyers and Cynthia's children all drove in one car, and I drove behind in another. It was a lonely trip. It's seven hours from New Orleans to Valdosta, and we did it one way one day and back the next. Once the lawyers got in contact with the children, it was a whole different case, and they had a lot more material to work with. The children told the lawyers about their mother's relationship with a man who had taken her to Valdosta and then forced her to prostitute herself. And through police reports and other sources, they eventually confirmed that Allen had suffered physical and sexual abuse throughout her life. These cases are very emotional because we're also attached to Cynthia. It, it gets very emotional and it's hard. Another breakthrough. The public defenders found a test showing that Allen's IQ was 59. Georgia law forbids the execution of those with an IQ below 70. The lawyers planned to present all this evidence in court, and Henderson wanted to wait to see it happen. But he had run out of time. It was now late 2006, and his editors were pushing him to finish his series. Finally, in early 2007, almost four years after he had begun, Stephen Henderson went to press without knowing whether or not Cynthia Allen would be convicted or sentenced to death if she were. This one is the same as this one. The three-part series ran in McClatchy newspapers across the country. It was a unique take on a little-told story for Washington Bureau Chief John Walcott. An awful lot of journalism today <laughs> consists of handing bullhorns to people who already have microphones. And what this story does is to speak for people who have no voice. You never hear about these people. They're not terribly sympathetic people. But under the law, they deserve the same quality of representation as an executive at Enron does. One of the great things about being a journalist is, for me is that I'm an optimist. And I believe that we make progress in small steps sometimes, but it's progress. This story, I think, is one of those that's a small step kind of story because the passions about death penalty are so strongly felt that it's not going to be something that's going to change overnight. There's a postscript to this story. Stephen Henderson recently learned that the Georgia Capitol defenders negotiated Cynthia Allen's case with the district attorney. She pled guilty to four counts of felony murder. As for her sentence? They negotiated enough with the DA to come up with 
something less than the death penalty as punishment for her, which was the whole goal of the office in the case. I think, you know, the victims' families in that case are not particularly pleased, but the truth of it in this country is that, you know, the law exists to protect everybody, and in particular, that has its greatest force when it's protecting the weakest and the most undesirable. The protection of their rights really is what ensures the protection of everybody's rights. You blow through theirs, it's a lot easier to blow through somebody else's. Expose has been provided by 